Hello everyone, I'm Ali Tinson and welcome to the second Turn, Learn and Pray Worry talk. I hope you've watched the first talk and know that we've made these videos to share practically applicable, theologically sound advice on living without being overwhelmed by worry, especially during the current COVID-19 pandemic. The first talk took a whistle-stop tour of the psychology of worry and concluded with how we can, as Christians, establish positive, non-anxious patterns of behaviour. This second talk will build on this foundation of knowledge, offering practical activities and techniques to help establish a livable, God-centred anti-worry habit using the turn, learn and pray model. So first, let's look at what it means to turn. Living out the anti-worry habit means that when we're worried or feeling under pressure about something, our go-to response can be pausing, turning away from the details of our day-to-day -day, and turning to God, seeking him and then praising him. If we look at the Bible, we see many stories showing that rescue, release and redemption often begins when we turn or return to God. Uh, 1 Samuel 7 tells the story of the Israelites turning back to the Lord after many years of worshipping idols and going their own way. Samuel doesn't mince his words, telling the Israelites, if you are truly serious about coming back to God, clean your house, get rid of the foreign gods, ground yourselves firmly in God, worship him and him alone. As Nicky Gumbel says, the first thing you need to do in your life when you are seeking God's presence and help is remove anything that is drawing your attention and focus away from God. So the first part of the turn process is to seek God and have a clean sweep where possible of anything in your life that might be distracting you from spending time with God becoming too important to you or adding to your worry levels. For me, I know my phone can become all three of these, <laughs> a distraction, too important and a source of stress. It's hard to be vigilant with it, but it comes back to this idea of seeking God first and to paraphrase Samuel, having a daily life spring clean in order to see God more clearly, ground ourselves firmly in him and worship him and him alone. And that brings us nicely to the second part of the turn process, worshiping God. When worry is swirling around our ankles like an impenetrable fog, obscuring our paths and tripping us up, that's the time to stop trying to walk forward, to pause, refocus on the presence of God and praise him, declaring his kingship, his power, his everlasting love and faithfulness. This attitude of adoration during distress is modelled throughout the Bible. Paul and Silas singing their hearts out while in chains is the obvious example, but, I know, but by no means the only one. We only have to take a brief glimpse at the Psalms to see distress and unfettered praise lived out together. They are chock full of examples of this attitude of trust-filled adoration, even in very unpleasant or downright dangerous circumstances. These Psalms very often describe layer on layer of turmoil interjected with or concluded with declarations of absolute trust in the Lord and crucially, worshipful adoration of him. Pete Gregg in his book, How to Pray, suggests that one of the easiest ways of building adoration into our own prayer lives is simply to read a psalm or part of a longer one every morning and every evening. He goes on to say, it never ceases to amaze me that this is the very same prayer book that Jesus used and loved. 
I often find that my feelings and priorities are realigned as the Psalms draw me into a worldview older and stranger than my own. To us, this juxtaposition of anguish and adoration may seem a little bit odd, but that may be because the scope of worship and praise has been minimised in our culture, something that is reinforced by the almost therapeutic, self-focused lyrics of some popular Christian songs. If we reduce worship to just being about praising God for something, what he's done or is doing for us and in our lives, then when things are difficult, of course, we'll struggle with praising him. We think my life's really hard at the moment and God seems so distant, so I don't feel much like praising him. But more than just being about what God is doing, praising for, praise is about who God is. And God is God, regardless of what is going on in our lives. And he is always worthy of our adoration. I can be on top of the world or in a pit of despair and God is still God, deserving of all the glory and honour and praise. Worship isn't about who I am and what's going on in my life. It's about who he is, who he's always been and who he always will be, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Most High, our Father, our Saviour, our Friend. And as well as giving God the glory he deserves, the sort of widescreen super HD view of him that active God-focused praise and worship gives us can also have the positive side effect of realigning our thoughts and regaining a healthier perspective when we're in the middle of a worry spiral. And this realignment of feelings and priorities is key to bringing balance to the worried mind and is at the core of the turn part of developing the anti-worry habit. Lifting our eyes from our own circumstances and acknowledging that yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, indeed everything that is in the heavens and on the earth, shifts our perspective and refocuses our mind. That's not to diminish the importance of dealing with the stuff and concerns of our day to day. We do still have to actually live. But by narrowing our focus to better concentrate on the worrying details and obsess about solving the problems of the day, two things happen. First, with this narrow focus, our worries seem enormous because they take up the entirety of our field of vision. And second, we risk cropping God out of the picture entirely. So we need to widen our focus, open up our vista to be able to see our worries size accurately. And also to include God in our perspective. Not that we can ever fit him in properly, he's too big. And that's the point. God is always going to be bigger and more glorious than we can see or imagine. And he is always worthy of our focus, worship and adoration. A fact that doesn't change with the fluctuations of our daily lives. So on a practical day-to-day -day level, turn involves literally turning our thoughts, actions and lives towards God sweeping away time-consuming distractions and reprioritizing our time to focus more on God, actively acknowledging his greatness and worshipping him with thinking, speaking, writing, singing, crafting, dancing, walking in his creation. In short, turn means living our days with a God-focused attitude of adoration. In order to authentically worship God, 
We need a biblically grounded and informed understanding of who he is, his kingship, his sovereignty, his character, which brings us to the next part of the anti-worry model. Learn. The learn element of anti-worry is probably the simplest to explain. In a nutshell, it's reading the Bible. And yet it's the one thing many of us struggle to do, literally leaving it on a shelf gathering dust. But in order to gain a better understanding of who God is, as well as the key concepts of control, will and submission, we do need to read and keep reading the Bible. This means reading the Bible every day and reading it deeply. As I said in the first video, not just dipping a toe in every now and then, but properly wading into his word right up to the neck and getting to know him more. To do this, we'll need to make time to sit with his word. And that's hard, life's busy, but sometimes it really is as simple as deciding God is more important than EastEnders or University Challenge, turning off the television and picking up a Bible. It might mean having a really good look at how you think about reading the Bible. Is it on the to-do list of jobs, chores to get through, when it could be on the treat list of things you look forward to? And it probably should be on the essentials list along with eating, drinking and breathing. God's word is our spiritual food. It's as essential to our spiritual health as eating, drinking and breathing is to our physical health. There are absolutely loads of really great tools out there to help us both read the Bible and get, gain a better understanding of what it says. Uh, the U Version Bible app has all the major Bible versions along with hundreds of daily re Bible reading plans on every subject you could imagine. You can set up reminders to read or listen to your plans and also receive a daily Bible verse as a prompt to read further. The app I'm using most at the moment for my Bible reading is the Bible in One Year app, which features Bible readings and mini talks by Nikki Gumbel, explaining and opening up the passages and drawing whole Bible links, which open up the overarching narratives. I find, I find that really helpful. Uh, you can choose whether to read or listen, or both. I prefer to read and listen, as reading helps keep my wandering butterfly mind focused, and the Bible passages are read so beautifully by David Suchet that listening feels like a genuine treat. Who wouldn't enjoy curling up and having the Bible read to them by Poirot? As well as reading the Bible every day, another helpful element of the learn part of the anti-worry habit is memorising Bible verses. As children and teenagers, we memorise Bible verses during Sunday school, but we don't often seem to do this as adults, which is a real shame, because the practice of embedding scripture in our memories is incredibly helpful to the worried mind. We obviously need to be careful not just to cherry pick comforting verses, plucking them out of context and using them as scriptural sticking plasters, but there is real value in learning some well-chosen verses by heart so they're in our heads as a go-to depository of truth when our heads are swirling with the lies and false perspectives of worry. Carla Harding of the 24-7 prayer uh, team says, meditating on God's word helps me put down deep, life-giving roots that hold me steady, sustaining and nourishing me from within. This process of learning scripture by heart and by head, alongside establishing a daily habit of Bible reading, is such a simple concept but can have a properly transformative effect on our inner thought life, as well as helping us to know God better and deepen our understanding of and relationship with him. Because as understanding and relationship develop and as the Holy Spirit fills and transforms us, so our experience of who he is and his impact on our lives develops. And 
If we let it, this can lead to us relinquishing the desire to control outcomes that's at the root of so much worry and developing a new willingness to submit to God's agenda and let go of ours. And in order to gain this experience of and relationship with God, we need to grow deeper communication with him in thanksgiving, in joyful worship, and crucially, in prayer. So now we're at the final step of our anti-worry habit. Prayer. Pray. Pray is intentional communion. Prayer is intentional communion with God. Its expression is individual to each Christian and thus an important part of this process for worry Christians will be finding a style of prayer which suits us. In order to build prayer into and throughout our daily lives as an expression of worship and relationship with God. So I'm not going to launch into a how to pray seminar. Prayer is such an enormously expansive topic. I could literally talk about it nonstop until the rest of my hair goes white and still have things left to say. So I'm going to restrict myself to very topic specific forms of prayer that can be built into daily life and have a positive impact on the worrying mind. With those parameters in place, I'll just do a quick whistle stop tour of a few fantastic resources for establishing a daily prayer habit before moving on to the main prayer activity I'm going to talk about in this context, prayer journaling. So our whistle stop tour begins with the Lectio 365 app produced by the fantastically knowledgeable team at 24 seven prayer. I start my day with Lectio 365 and it's such a source of blessing and joy to me. It's a lovely way to start the day with God and is very much in line with the ideas behind Turn, Learn and Pray. Along the same theme, the 24 seven prayer website is a treasure trove of prayer ideas, resources and information. In particular, their Help Me Pray page is really helpful to those of us wanting to find out more about daily prayer practices and how we can build prayer into our own days. The YouVersion Bible app also has a huge variety of prayer themed Bible reading plans and the final destination of our whistle stop tour of prayer resources is, of course, the Bible itself. Praying the Psalms is a beautiful way of praising, talking with or crying out to God. And the Bible as a whole is literally bursting with lives lived in communication with God. From the very beginning right through to the end, the Bible models prayer as the key to how we should be living our lives. And Jesus himself is our best example, obviously, of a life lived in relationship and communication with the Father. So that's our quick flip through prayer resources. And now we'll start having a look at prayer journaling, which is such a great habit to establish for those of us who live with worry. Anyone who knows me well will know I'm a huge fan of prayer journaling. And for me, it takes the form of written thoughts and prayers. For people who don't find writing easy or valuable, there are other forms of prayer journaling which may be more helpful, like drawing, uh, voice recording, taking or collecting photos and images, mind mapping or making a video journal. There are even prayer journaling apps for people who prefer the digital option. Prayer journaling is such a simple habit to establish. And if it's embedded as a daily or at least reliably regular activity, it can have an overwhelmingly positive effect on mental health, particularly for people who carry a whole door of worries around with them everywhere. My own journaling technique is ever so slightly batty, but I'm going to share it with you anyway, so please be kind. <laughs> uh, for probably nearly 20 years, I've been journaling fairly but not wholly consistently using this method and it is a significant part of my daily prayer life. So every evening when I go to bed, before Poirot reads me the Bible, I take out my very small notebook 
and my cherished four colour pen. And with God, I think about my day. First, I use the blue pen and I record the bare bones of the day I've just lived, the activities, the lulls, the neutral facts. Next, I use the red pen. And with this, I write down all the negatives. And this might be worries, or it might be things I felt I got wrong, things I found embarrassing or uncomfortable, things people might have said or done which I don't feel good about, things I just wish had gone a bit better. After the negative red comes the positive green, and with the green pen, I write down all the good of the day. So this is everything I'm grateful for. Everything that puts a smile on my face while I'm writing it. Everything that went pretty okay. And because I'm a big fan of words of affirmation, I'll also write down anything nice anyone said to me, even if it's just a cheery mm, yum from the kids about a meal I've made. And after the green comes the black pen, which is when I mash all of it together and write my whole day up as an intentional prayer. Beginning with praise, thanks, then confession, and then talking all of the day over with God, interceding for friends, family and others, and explicitly getting any worries out of my head onto paper and into God's hands. And during this time, we'll pause and I'll listen as well. Now, you might be wondering why I bother with the other colours and why I don't just crack straight on with a prayer bit. And actually that is very simple. First, I find it really helpful to gather my scattered thoughts onto the page before praying them through. And second, and probably more significantly for my mental health and emotional well-being, if I'm having a tough few days, or sometimes just because I like to be reminded, I flick through my journals, both current and increasingly ancient ones, and always, it always does me good to see that no matter how tough life was when I was writing these journals, there is always, always more green than red. Every single time. In every journal I've ever written over the last nearly two decades, green always wins by absolutely miles and leaves red in the dust. And that does me good and it stokes up my flames of gratitude, even in the dark times. So that's my own journal style and genuinely establishing a prayerful journaling habit has been a big part of my own anti-worry story. The reason I journal at bedtime is because I am, from early childhood, a chronic insomniac. And extracting thoughts from my head and handing them over to God has been a very helpful technique for me over the years. Just as a slight detail, while we're talking about insomnia, which for many worries starts because our brains are busy mulling over a tangle of worries and continues because we become worried about not sleeping, I will just quickly mention a little technique which I found helpful. I keep a pencil and a blank notepad ring bound so I can leave it open flat at the right page next to my bed. Whenever I wake up in the night and can't settle, I reach for my notepad <laughs> in the dark. This only works if the lights are off. I usually leave my eyes closed as well. Uh, and I write down every thought that's in my head, no matter how small. It may sound silly, and for the first few times it probably will feel silly, but it works. And after I've finished emptying my head, onto the page, in the dark, I pray and I acknowledge that God is over everything and I settle back down to rest and maybe even sleep. Well, that was a lovely little detour and now I'm actually going to stay slightly detoured but I promise I'm actually meandering back to the original topic. I'd just like to briefly mention how prayer journaling or a form of prayer journaling can be helpful for children of pretty much any age in helping them to settle at bedtime. So in our house, we call it the daily download. And it goes like this. I have got my children's permission to share this, by the way. Um, so every night at the children's bedtimes, either my husband, Neil, or myself, 
or both of us, if we're both at home, ask the children a set sequence of questions about the day. We've experimented a bit and dropped a few questions and added a few others over the years. And the ones that work best for our children are, what was your best bit of the day? Were there any bad bits? What was the funniest thing about today? Are you excited about anything today? And is there anything else in your head that needs to come out? This last one tends to be the most crucial and then, because it, it's then that concerns, questions, confusions and worry come tumbling out. To be honest though, we very often have quite a lot of fun doing the download because reliving the funniest bits of the day tends to set us all off again and also the answers the children give can spark some interesting and quirky chats. We do, just to briefly interject here, we do their downloads individually. So we'll do one and then the other. It's really important that they feel they can get stuff out of their head on their own. And it's a really good one-to-one, -one, or usually in our case, two-to-one time together. So the final part of the download is praying. Giving all of the thanks, praise, concerns, laughs of the day over to God. Essentially, it's full colour journaling, but with chatting instead of writing. The reason we started doing this is because when they were very young, both of our children had very frequent and distressing nightmares and became scared to sleep, our youngest in particular. Uh, having read that dreams are a way our brains process the day and sort it into various categories to decide whether it needs to keep hold of it or not, um, we wondered if verbally processing the key elements of the day would encourage their brains to do a bit of early admin and reduce the nightmares. So we tried it and it worked. But we also found that it had a positive knock-on effect on the children's worry processing. Getting their worries out of their heads and into the open nearly always reduces the impact of the worries as, just like mouth ulcers, they seem much, well, they look much smaller from the outside than they feel on the inside. Also, praying the day through with them gives them first-hand experience of God's kindness in answering prayers whilst putting down early roots to grow a daily prayer habit. Okay, so that was a second picturesque little detour, but at least that one was about prayer. So, and actually it gives us another type of prayer journaling to add to our list, sharing our own daily download with a prayer journal partner, a sort of verbal prayer journal a friend or a spouse or a relative, someone with whom we share mutual trust and accountability. WhatsApp is great for this. And it's another way to anchor our day in God's safe harbour, entrusting our daily thoughts and actions to him in prayer. So now we've looked at a few ideas about building prayer into our daily lives, let's revisit little Billy from the first workshop. Well, it's been a while and now he's all grown up. An established worrier and a worry-induced insomniac to boot. Poor, not so little Billy. But there's hope on the horizon because he's been learning about anti-worry and is trying the techniques. He's been turning his focus and his life orientation towards God and has been learning about him by reading his Bible and working through some of the helpful resources he's found on the Bible Society and the 24-7 prayer websites. He started prayer journaling by making voice memos at the end of each day and texting them to his friend Alan, who phones once or twice a week when they pray together. But tonight's a bad night and sleep keeps deserting him. When Billy used to wake up in the night, his previous instinct would have been to get tense and frustrated, maybe a bit panicky, that he wasn't sleeping, his mind flooding with the things from the day that he wished were different, and the things of tomorrow that he was worried about or trying to find a solution for. But this time, he remembers his anti worry techniques. He reaches down beside his bed for his pad and pencil, keeps his eyes shut, and he writes down every worry, every concern or frustration, every random thought in short phrases to get it all out of his head and onto the paper. 
taking the thoughts out of the immediate time of rest and placing them into, mor- into tomorrow where they could be read and dealt with or discarded. He then lays back down and prays. Then he recites Psalm 8 in his head while taking a few deep breaths to resettle himself. And the interesting thing about this technique and all the techniques actually is that the more Billy practices them, the more embedded they become as behaviours, the more his brain will recognise and remember what he's doing and the more effective they'll become. And eventually, if he practices and perseveres, these techniques will become so established that they will become habitual. Good for Billy. Professor of Addiction Psychiatry Julia Sinclair is an expert in managing habitual behaviours and makes the really key point that we change our thoughts by doing things rather than changing our actions by thinking things. So persevering with the techniques and positive behaviours is essential. And I have an excellent personal example of why, although it's a bit embarrassing and definitely shows that my own medicine is only effective if I actually take it. So early on in the lockdown, when my husband first started working from home and the children first started homeschooling, I was overwhelmed by the sudden transition from spending around five hours nearly every weekday on my own to suddenly sharing all of my everydays with a house full of Tinsons. It was lovely, actually. They're my three favourite people in the world, but it was overwhelming and my brain became too full of experiences and thoughts and concerns and must do betters to sleep. And I was so busy, I totally forgot to practice the anti-worry techniques. So for a week or so, I had absolutely terrible nights and I felt cross and frustrated and panicky. And then one day, A friend texted to ask how I was doing, and I told her about the insomnia, the worry, and the feeling overwhelmed. As I was typing, I suddenly realised that I'd been allowing myself to focus on my worries and allowing my brain to hold on to these thoughts of the day instead of giving them to God. So I re-established a pattern of morning prayer with the Lectio 365 app, of ending my day with the Bible in One Year app, and of keeping a notepad next to the bed, writing my journal every night, praying while writing, and both my anxiety levels and my sleep improved again. So these techniques really do work, but only if you use them. (laughs) I really hope you found these videos helpful because living under the dark cloud of worry is so tough, far better to take steps to walk out into the light and live your life standing in awe of the sun. I'll now continue to practice what I preach and close by praying Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of your children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, What is humankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings, that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, 
our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth.